Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Peoria Riverbrook Museum. I see lots of members and visionary members here, and I'd like to thank our visionary members for helping to sponsor free events like this. We're partnering with the Peoria Journal Star, who is underwriting this event. All our journalists are coming here as volunteers. In fact, we have one, Pam Adams, who's out covering a story right now. She's our education reporter at Peoria Journal Star. Thank you again for coming. Is anyone in the house who is here for the first time? Well, that's great. It's good to see people coming back. Oh, well, welcome to the museum. We hope you enjoy it. I'd like to introduce our president and CEO, John Morris. John? Welcome, everyone. Thank you. So are we ready? Yeah. So on behalf of the board of directors and the 25 full-time staff members here at the museum and our 4,000 members and our Visionary Society members and all of us who work constantly to bring about a multidisciplinary museum unlike any other in the country, art, science, history, and achievement. You know, we're the only one for those four pillars. It's such a thrill because we have partnerships in this community that help support this privately funded museum uh, that is run by you. Those of you who are members and supporters help us to do what we do to inspire people, inspire confidence and lifelong learning and unleashing of talent. Those are our objectives. So when we look for partnerships, it was a thrill to us uh, to have uh, the premier a news organization, the journalists of this community at the Peoria Journal Star, uh, which itself goes back so far in the history of this state and this city uh, to work with us on a panel tonight that really will lift us up in terms of our exploration of who we are and the leaders we have produced in the past. And I want to particularly point out that on this panel is a great friend of this museum who is now retired from the Journal Star, uh, but who wrote 147 editorial uh, uh, editorials in support of the idea that there should be a museum uh, like this in Peoria, Bart Gray. And Shelley wrote a bunch of them too. Shelley Epstein wrote one, he says. So, uh, so I want to point uh, Barb's presence. She has been a tireless advocate and she's, she's been doing her job as a journalist, but help me welcome one of the panelists, Pam Adams. Come, come on in and take a seat, Pam. What an entrance. Thank you, Pam. Is your story turned in? <laughs> so I also want to point out uh, Dennis Anderson, uh, the, the managing editor of the Bureau Journal Star, who has put together uh, just a terrific uh, panel of uh, experts tonight and journalists from this community to help us go over this exploration. And uh, I'd like us uh, to give Dennis Anderson, he'll speak to you in a moment, but give Dennis our, our warm appreciation. Dennis, thank you. Dennis had, uh, I'm going to hold up, I'm going to do a little Journal Star propaganda here, but this is an insert, 200 of the Bicentennial, uh, that uh, the Journal Star put together. And I will tell you, we, we, we have gotten coverage all over the state uh, and, and all over the country for this museum. In fact, the Tribune got it right today because they wrote we're the 22nd best cultural asset in the state of Illinois today. And uh, uh, that's meaningful, but I, I will tell you, uh, um, they've finally gotten something right here about Central Illinois and the Tribune, but it makes me much more excited tonight to have our own anchor here. And I will tell you, Dennis Anderson, in all of journalism in the state of Illinois during this bicentennial, he is the champion. He has put together a network of newspapers throughout the state of Illinois. We, you, are, are you reading the columns uh, and the articles on the bicentennial of the Journal Star? How do you like those? <clears throat> all Dennis's brainstorm. So it's a real privilege uh, to welcome you tonight to what I think will be uh, a wonderful exploration, a long time coming of those Peorians who changed the world. So, ladies and gentlemen, help me welcome uh, the managing editor of the Journal Star, Dennis Anderson. Thank you, John, that uh, very kind words, I appreciate that. Um, 
But I want to get to this panel pretty quickly, but a few things I need to go over. Some ground rules. We're not going to take any questions about your delivery. <laughs> but we will talk a lot about uh, important people to Peoria. And if you haven't had a chance to look at the, um, the bicentennial exhibit here at the museum, it's really good. It, it's, it's outstanding. Please take a chance to take a look at that. And this has been a good, uh, a good partnership between the, the newspaper and the museum to, to talk about uh, the Illinois Bicentennial. I'm a, I think all of us are Illinois people. We're all born in the state, uh, live here. Some of them have gone away for a little bit, but we're all we're here now. Um, Illinois is our home. And um, since last December, the Journal Star has been working on a year-long project with the Illinois Press Association and the Illinois Associated Press Media Editors. Our weekly series of stories is being pr produced by 20 newspapers across the state, and more than 100 newspapers are publishing these stories that you're seeing on Mondays in the Journal Star. Even the St. Louis Post-Dispatch is running these, these stories. What we published so far, some of the things you may have read, uh, it, it's been the uh, Underground Railroad, Illinois' border war with Wisconsin, and it's got nothing to do with the Bears and the Packers, <laughs> Native Americans in Illinois, the coal mining industry, growth of Sears. Um, and coming next week is a feature on baseball maverick Bill, Be Bill Beck. And coming down the pipeline, we also have a great mi migration. Ronald Reagan's Illinois. Illinois during World War I and World War II. I can't, iconic jazz and blues musicians. And Route 66. And even Illinois gangsters. So on to tonight's panel. Uh, Nick Vlahos, I'm sure he's been hit, uh, writing for the Journal Star for over 30 years. He does Nick in the morning. He has this thing, every day when I come in to work, he's saying, Dennis, or anybody else, Peoria is the center of the universe. And he goes on to tell us stories from that day, something in the news, and he can put a connection to that news, to that person who's in the news, to, to get us to, to say, here, it's, it's really happening every day. But tonight we're talking about six prominent people from the Peoria area. U.S. Senator Everett Dirksen, Nancy Brick Brinker of the Susan G. Coleman Foundation, feminist Betty Friedan, civil rights leader C.T. Vivian, Bishop Fulton Sheen, who is a candidate for sainthood, and comedian Richard Pryor. We have a lot, that's just six people, but there's a long list of, uh, of people that, that, uh, that we, we, we were looking at first, so who should we be talking about? You know, everyone from Dan Fogelberg to Dr. Dr. Bertie Cahill and Robert Cahill, who's a scientist uh, who produced mass, mass uh, made sure pencil could be mass produced. It's a long list of people, dozens and dozens. But tonight's panelists that we have here, we have Chris Kiergaard. Chris? Chris is our political reporter and one half of the Word on the Street column. Chris leads our Illinois primary co coverage last week. And as our sports department describes it, it's Friday night every, every night during the football season. We have Barb Drake. We've heard a lot about Barb already. <laughs> Barb's the one who came up with that list to share with us, and over time, I'm sure we'll get to some of those other people. Uh, Pam Adams is our education reporter. <laughs> Pam, she stands for everything that I believe a reporter should. She finds the heart of the story. She's digging into what numbers mean to the reader and telling stories from the point of view of the teacher and the student rather than the elected officials. Thanks, Pam. And columnist Phil Luciano. Good morning, please. So you're, you're, you're good. good Feel it. <laughs> He's been our uh, columnist for, over, uh, for nearly 30 years. Some ground rules, we're gonna have, we're gonna talk about our, the six people that we're, uh, we're talking about today, commemorating. Um, we'll save the Q&A for the end. 
and uh, we'll, I'll, I'll be asking you to ask, quite, I'll be pointing to people to, have, to ask questions and the panel will be answering them. So let's go start with Chris here to talk about Senator Thurston. And I feel like I got picked first for this uh, because I am the one who's, who's doing the first of our Peorians who's actually not a Peorian. I want to acknowledge that at the beginning. Uh, we're, we're talking first about Everett Dirksen from Pekin, from the Peoria area, who still made a difference. And as I go into the program, for all of us, it, it's crucially important to cite our sources when we're reporting. And as somebody who studied history, it's important to me to cite sources. I had that beaten into me all throughout my undergrad to make sure you cite in your footnotes. So I want to call, call your attention as I begin this to a number of items that helped inform this presentation, including parts of Everett Dirksen's own biography, Education of a Senator, as well as the excellent book that came out in 2014 addressing the evolution of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. An Idea Whose Time Has Come by Todd Purdom, who came and spoke at Bradley University about it at that time, as well as interviews with, among others, Frank Mackman at the Dirksen Congressional Center and uh, Bob Lovey, who serves as a history professor at Colorado College and was an aide to one of Dirksen's top assistants back in the 1960s and was involved in the crafting of some of this legislation. If at any point you can't hear me during this presentation or any of the others, please shout, give a wave like you're drowning, something so that we can try and speak up. I'm not quite sure if you hear how well the microphone is working. So, Everett Dirksen. We have on this list primarily for his championship, his support of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. And because of that support from Dirksen, that act became law. In fact, People at the time, including Hubert Humphrey, who on the Democratic side of the aisle helped shepherd it through, said that without Dirksen, it would not have become law. If you don't believe Humphrey and what he had to say about it, believe what Dr. Martin Luther King said about it at the time in writing to Dirksen. He wrote, Without your able and courageous leadership on the Republican forces in the Senate, the strong bipartisan Civil Rights Act of 1964 would not have been possible. You have earned the sincere gratitude of freedom-loving people the world over. Okay, so Dirksen helped get the law passed. How did he help get that law passed? He helped get it passed by being difficult on the bill. Not by immediately signing on when he was asked to sign on, not by immediately agreeing 100% to the legislation that came over from the House of Representatives that was proposed. Dirksen understood that his agreement, his support for that legislation was not going to be enough. Dirksen understood the legislative process as a master of his craft, as somebody who knew that legislative deal-making was about getting the most number of people to yes that you could. Because Dirksen understood that the fight to get it passed was not a fight to get to 51 votes and pass the legislation. It was a fight to break the filibuster that then Southern Democrats were going to stage. And for that, at the time, you needed to get 67 <laughs> votes a supermajority beyond anything required even today in the polarizing political climate that we have. So he needed to bring along as many Republicans as he could, along with his own support of the legislation. And to do that, he needed negotiated amendments to overcome any and all of the concerns that members of his side of the aisle might have while still preserving the core integrity of the legislation and helping it go as far as it possibly could to achieve the aims that he wanted. So he was intimately involved in crafting those proposals on the amendments that would bring along the Republicans and make it palatable to the most number of them, along with the Northern and Western progressive Democrats who were going to vote for it. Hubert Humphrey said at the time this, 
to Democrats who were upset on the, the progressive side of the aisle there about how long it was taking to bring along Dirksen and his amendments. He said, quote, he's not trying to be destructive, he's trying to be constructive. In essence, what Democratic leaders did by bringing Dirksen in at the very beginning, and this was a strategy that Lyndon Johnson had, that Lyndon Johnson called that play from the White House at the beginning to help get this passed, was playing on Dirksen's interest and, yes, his ego in crafting workable, enforceable legislation and being recognized as the person who helped make that happen. And he played that role in the Hill for months in backroom negotiations. How did he come to support all of this, though? How did he come to the point that he became the linchpin of passing this piece of civil rights legislation? Dirksen writes in his memoirs about his service on the District of Columbia Committee in the House. And in those memoirs, he mostly focuses on the role in helping him meet the leading lights of local and regional power at dinners that were had uh, at which members of the District of Columbia Committee were invited because essentially, then as now, that committee controlled the funding for the district and controlled what local leaders there could and couldn't do. He writes about humorous incidents in which he helped get drunk congressmen and friends of congressmen their wallets back after they lost them in taxi cabs or helped get, get them out of tickets. In short, he played on humor for that in his autobiography. But Dirksen Congressional Center Director Frank McAmon notes in, in an interview with me that I have a hunch that his service on the District of Columbia Committee put him in daily contact with the issues faced by African Americans residing in the district. That gave him the face-to-face -face contact with those issues that he might have lacked in central Illinois, particularly coming from a town like Pekin that at the time was not particularly welcoming to minorities, and that might be an understatement. Uh, Dirksen never received uh, much support or a plurality in Cook County or in any other heavily African-American voting wards throughout the state of Illinois. So that experience on the District of Columbia Committee, understanding those issues was critical. Mackerman also notes that Dirksen's faith, which is present in many remarks in his biography, also helped imbue in him a sense of an idea whose time has come which is the moral component and a key part of the quote that he gave in the speech on the day that they broke that Southern filibuster. Some people might, in a casual look, also point to his first campaign, where when he went to bed on election night, when he was running for the US House for the first time, he was ahead by 4,400 votes and woke up the next day in the final count to discover that he was behind by 1,100 and had lost the primary. What was the reason? because a writer up in Bureau County had passed along in the mailboxes throughout the county a flyer that said, Dirksen is a member of the Ku Klux Klan. <laughs> now, up in Bureau County, though, it's important to note that that was not necessarily an issue of African American versus not in Bureau County at the time. That was playing on the anti-Catholicism for which the Klan had its notoriety there. So whether that was a link to his interest in civil rights legislation or not is debatable. Um, the Dirksen family, again, going to influence, did experience some discrimination early in his adult life during World War I when members of the Town Loyalty Committee took issue with his German mother keeping up a photo of Kaiser Wilhelm in their home. But she saw that as a free speech issue rather than one of, of ethnicity or anything else. Still, it compelled Dirksen to be the one in the family who signed up to fight in World War I. Colorado College history professor Bob Lovey does point out that there is, to be fair in assessing Dirksen's legacy, there is a political component to his support of at least the 1964 bill. He told me that we really thought that this was going to produce a wave of African-American support for the Republican Party. So there's a little bit of self-interest in, in support of legislation. But of course, that was damaged later in the year when Barry Goldwater got the Republican nomination, and further damaged four years later when Richard Nixon pursued his Southern strategy 
in the election and wiped out virtually any chance for Republican support for African Americans. But it really can't have been all politics because Dirksen came to the 1964 debate with a healthy record of supporting civil rights legislation behind him. In fact, that record goes all the way back to the FDR era when Dirksen served in the House. Over not quite four decades in public life, the Dirksen Center is able to document more than 140 pieces of civil rights legislation that Dirksen supported between the House and the Senate. Let me give you some examples. As early as 1939, this is from Frank Mackman, Dirksen succeeds in amending a bill that provided for federal funds for training airline pilots. Why? He wanted to make sure that money was available for training African-American airline pilots as well. In 1939, before the armed forces were integrated, before baseball was integrated, Dirksen was fighting for funds for airline pilots for African-Americans. He backed anti-poll tax legislation. He backed bills to combat mob violence, crucial in, in trying to combat the Klan's influence. And on top of that, he supported later legislation, which again suggests that it wasn't quite going after that political component after the, the 1964 campaign, because he was crucial in writing elements of the Voting Rights Act of 1965, and the portion of the 1968 Civil Rights Act involving fair housing. The popular quote, and the one that you'll see on display here in the museum, if you take a look through the bicentennial section, uh, is Dirksen paraphrasing Victor Hugo during the debate on breaking off the filibuster on the 64 Civil Rights Bill. Stronger than all the armies is an idea whose time has come. The time has come for equality of opportunity in sharing government, in education, and in employment. It will not be stayed or denied. It is here. And that's a powerful quote. But for understanding part of why Dirksen was such a champion, why he understood that that legislation needed to be passed, why his support was consistent throughout the years for civil rights legislation, look to a little bit later portion of that speech, where he follows that observation up with another one. America grows. America changes. And on the civil rights issue, we must rise with the occasion. We have Barb. Barb is going to be talking about two very prominent women in from our area, uh, Betty Friedan and uh, Nancy Brinker. Brinker. Thank you, and thank you all for coming and uh, making the point by your presence that we care about history. I was planning to open my comments on Betty Friedan and Nancy Goodman Brinker by reflecting on my belief that Peorians aren't as aware as we should be, aren't as aware as we should be, of how many of our neighbors really did change the world. I was already planning to do that when I picked up my March 12th Journal Star and found uh, the, sto the story headline, Notable figures of Illinois from A to Z. I looked in the B's, and I looked in the F's, and I found neither woman listed. <laughs> <laughs> now, okay. The journal started in right there. Okay, that's exactly what I was going to say. The story was written by someone from Arlington Heights. Uh, no Peoria still, journalist would have made that mistake. And in fairness. It does reflect uh, people chosen over 200 years. <laughs> Still, I would like to make the case tonight for just how important these women were uh, and are. I don't have to make that case to historians. They placed Friedan at number 29 on a list of the 100 most influential women of all time. Just ahead, just ahead of Joan of Arc. 
They said her book, The Feminine Mystique, was among the most, the 100 most influential books ever written. The Bible is on that list. Nor do I need to make that case to Time Magazine, which placed Brinker on its list of 100 most influential people in 2008. Or to Ladies Home Journal, which said she was among the 20th century's 100 most important women. Or for that matter, to President Obama, who awarded her the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the nation's highest civilian honor. And I may not meet, need to make that case to you, but I will anyway. And I will also talk about what Peoria had to do with it. Quite a bit, I believe. Many in this room can go back with me to 1963 when The Feminine Mystique was published. It was a time when women could work as airline stewardesses until they turned 30 or got pregnant when it was perfectly legal for potential employers to ask about pregnancy plans or refuse to hire women with preschool children, when states could deny women the right to serve on juries and could uh, uh, require that men control their assets, and when as aspiring journalists like myself were denied the opportunity to apply for a newspaper scholarship because didn't I know women didn't have newspaper careers? The emphasis on careers reflects the assumption that the proper role for women, for a woman, was wife and mother. For Dan's book grew out of a 1957 survey she did of her Smith College classmates for her, their 15th reunion. The survey found an unhappy bunch, 80% said their greatest re regret was not planning to link their education to a professor. Being wife and mother did not fulfill these women. The book argued for a more expansive view of women and more expansive roles for women. Futurist, the futurist Alvin Toffler said it pulled the trigger on history. I absolutely love that quote, mm -hmm. but it didn't pull hard enough. Laws to, to outlaw sex discrimination needed to be passed and enforcement me mechanisms established. For that, a revolution was needed in the model of the civil rights movement. And that is the background of a meeting that took place in 1966 at a Washington, D.C. hotel where 15 women agreed to establish the National Organization for Women. Ferdinand insisted that it be for women, not of women. She wanted men to be a part of it. And they elected Ferdinand its president. She would go on to establish two more important organizations, the National Abortion Rights Action League and the Women's Political Caucus, and to write five more books. I interviewed Betty in 1999 at her Washington, D.C. apartment right across the street from that hotel. What a thrill. She told me that something in her gut had told her that The Feminine Mystique would be an important book. Quote, I knew I wasn't just talking about overeducated Smith College women. I knew that it implied vast social change, she said. But she also said she couldn't possibly have predicted the incredible, the incredible impact it had. Nearly 40 years later, women still came up to her to say, it changed my life, it changed my whole life. And she asked me if the book had changed my life. I had to say yes. About three years after I was denied the opportunity to apply for that scholarship, the gender restriction was lifted. And many other changes came that opened up opportunities for me. I have to give a lot of credit to the feminine mystique. And there have been drastic changes in women's roles over the last 50 years. Compare 1960, when she was writing the book, she did it by hand. That's why it took so long, because she couldn't type. 
and uh, compare the 1960 data with the 2010 data. In 1960, women got just one third of bachelor's degrees and made up 3% of newly graduated dentists, lawyers, and doctors. Now about 60% of bachelor's degrees go to women, as do half of the law degrees and closely, close to half of new dental and medical school degrees. Labor force participation among married women with children has gone from 28 to 65 percent. Friedan deserves credit for sparking those changes. I asked Betty what further changes were needed. She said the next step must be, quote, a much more focused attention and priority attention to a child care program of activism in terms of legislation in terms of innovation. She said the government's failure to guarantee child care for working parents was the biggest disappointment of her career, bigger than the failure to pass the Equal Rights Amendment. That really surprised me. She said there needs to be, quote, a much more conscious push on parenting, not just being the mother's responsibility. End quote. Ideally, two parents should be involved in raising a child, she said. I see that happening now with our own kids, and I'm happy to say that. Sadly, 19 years later, there has been no progress on universal child care. In fact, there have been recent efforts at both the state and federal governments to cut child care funding for those who need it in order to work. I also asked her what she took out of Peoria that stayed with her 60 years after leaving. Her response, quote, I think that there is a certain solidity, a rootedness about America, about the United States. And second, I think it's in Peoria that I learned the power of community. In Peoria, there really was a can-do spirit of community organizing. If there was a problem, you could organize in the community to deal with the problem. She said that was something that you could not do in New York City. I also asked her, but she also took out of Peoria the terrible feeling of facing discrimination, not because of her gender. She didn't sense that here, she said, but because of her faith. Anti-Semitism kept her out of the sororities that dominated the high school social scene back then and cost her the friendships she'd had since grade school because her friends were joining them and leaving her behind. However, she did make new friends who would last a lifetime. Her brother, Harry Goldstein, told me she used to return home from time to time and bounce her ideas off those friends, quote, Sensible, real women, not the radical Eastern chick. <laughs> to see if they pass the middle American good sense test. Still, we shouldn't get past the fact that her exposure to discrimination occurred in this city and profoundly affected her. Quote, I had that experience and that certainly sharpened my sensitivity and outrage of injustice of any sort. She said, I got strength from growing up in Peoria, but I had to leave it to use it. She went on to express pleasure that, quote, the work I've done, my life's work, has made it much better for the women and girls that come from Peoria. The, the same can be said of the work done by another Peorian who changed the world, Nancy Goodman Brinker. It has been 39 years since a young Nancy Goodman promised her sister, Susan Goodman Coleman, who was dying, that she would do everything in her power to end breast cancer. It has been 36 years since Brinker launched what is now called Susan G. Coleman for the Cure, with the running of the first Race for the Cure in Dallas, where she lived. The second, of course, was in Peoria, her hometown. The race is the largest and most successful education and fundraising event ever created for breast cancer. It is run in more than 60 countries 
and has raised more than $3 billion. Since 1989, the number of deaths from breast cancer has been reduced by 40%. In the United States, 90% of breast cancer victims survive at least five years, and 83% live 10 years or more. Bertha herself is among those survivors. Three years after her sister died, she was diagnosed with breast cancer. Survivors are the good news. The bad news is that in this country, 40,000 still die from it every year. But it would be a lot more without the foundation's push for early detection and the research it funds. That research is, to a considerable extent, responsible for finding and developing some of the drugs that have contributed to breast cancer's curability. Only the federal government puts more money into fighting the disease. I interviewed Brinker in 2002 at the American Embassy in Budapest, where she was new ambassador to Hungary. In addition to the usual work diplomats do, her responsibilities included encouraging Hungary to be a leader in the war on terrorism and monitoring its commitments. But her profound passion for breast cancer victims stayed with her. She was pushing for better health services in Hungary and encouraging the, larging, encouraging the development of what was a largely absent nonprofit activism and philanthropy. A glamorous job, as some critics wrote, not by what I saw. It was nine months after the attack on the World Trade Center when we talked, and the embassy was guarded and barricaded. She loved to run for exercise, but she could only do that when accompanied by armored vehicles. Even something that sounds as simple as ordering a new couch for her residence wasn't easy. She couldn't have a style she liked covered with a pattern she liked, as I have done, and I'm sure many of you have done, because of the fear that an explosive device could be implanted in it during that process. She had to take her furniture right off the floor and go home with it. Her days ran from 5 a.m. until midnight. She said she asked to be assigned to Hungary because so many Hungarian Jews had been slaughtered during the Holocaust. Like the Friedans, the Goodmans are Jewish, and they'd lost numerous family members. But why in the world would this rich woman who could have done anything or nothing want to do this? Brinker said while growing up in Peoria, she came to believe she needed to serve her country. Quote, I never got to serve in the Army, and I feel very moved right now, she told me. And of course, this was just after 911. Much like Friedan, she credited her thinking to Peoria, speaking with passion of the importance of stewardship and sacrifice. Those lessons she learned right here, largely from her mother, Ellie Goodman, she said. Nancy recalled sitting in the back seat of their car being hauled to charity events when she'd much rather have been at Dairy Queen. <laughs> Since leaving Hungary, uh, Brinker has served in other positions, including White House Chief of Protocol. But the subject today is Peorians who changed the world. And if you or someone you love has had breast cancer, this woman's efforts have surely changed your world for the better. Not much more need be said except for one thing more. The work of the foundation she established was critically important in bringing about a major change in how medical research is done. No longer do we assume that women's and men's bodies are much the same, so we don't have to test drugs on women. That was a wrong assumption. The hormones differ, the bodies differ, and now you have to do research on both. Thank you. I'd like to invite Pam up next. So she's going to talk to us about C.T. Vivian, a civil rights leader.
Let me know if I'm holding it wrong or too close or not talking loud enough. Um, and I must tell you, if I get something wrong or leave something out, CT Vivian Stoddard is here. Um, but Cordy Tyndale Vivian will be 94 on July 28th. Yeah, he's lived to see the 50th anniversary of the Freedom Rides Through the South. He's lived to see the 50th anniversary of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the 50th anniversary of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Hmm. He's lived to have the country's first black president place the medal, Presidential Medal of Freedom around his neck. And he's lived to see himself depicted in a mainstream Hollywood movie about one of the more violent periods of the civil rights movement. And that's the Selma campaign, which led to the Voting Rights Act of 1965. But none of that happened before a sheriff named Joe Clark punched C.T. Vivian on the courthouse steps as he tried to lead black residents of Selma to the courthouse to register to vote. And it's not before a state trooper killed young Lim Jimmy Lee Jackson during a, peace during a peaceful protest that Vivian organized. And it's not before more state troopers and their posses brutally beat black back marchers as they tried to march 60 miles from Selma to Montgomery in, an, in what became known as Bloody Sunday. People were literally beaten and or killed to get voting rights for everybody. And C.T. Vivian is living testimony to that. Before he got to Selma, he had been stabbed, drowned, imprisoned, you know, all in the name of something as simple as uh, racial in integration. He's in great shape today, I'm told. So he will probably be in demand as many people prepare to recognize the upcoming 50th anniversary of the assassination of Martin Luther King on April 4th. And he was part of a select group of ministers known as King's Lieutenants. And they, along with hundreds who followed them, really did help change the world. Anyone who really knows civil rights movement considers Dr. Vivian one of the great teachers of nonviolent civil disobedience. He was a critical participant in most of the major historic confrontations. And that's according to Alden Morris, a, a, an historist, a historian of the civil rights movement who happens to be a Bradley University grad. And you have to think about the country before the movement. Hardly any parts of the South were places you went for vacation or retirement. And racial segregation and discrimination were normal. Blustering, bigoted political leaders were normal, too. Um, but Vivian was part of that group that changed all that. And he called his brand of nonviolence radical good facing radical evil. I like to think the lives of the people we're discussing tonight intersected. I like to think that Dr. Vivian came across a young Richard Pryor when Vivian worked at Carver Center. I like to think that Nancy Brinker's family and Brett, Betty Friedan's family might have heard about Peoria's first sit-ins in the 1940s, when Vivian and a group of people conducted, um, tried to integrate the old bishop's cafeteria. I like to think that Vivian and his colleagues in the ministry of the black church analyzed what Bishop Fulton Sheen said and didn't say about the civil rights movement and the Vietnam War. 
And I like to think that as Congress debated the Civil Rights and Voting Rights Acts, that King and the other activists looked at Vivian and said, CT, you're from Illinois. What can we expect from this man? Um, he was born in Missouri. His mother and grandmother moved to Macomb when he was six because they wanted to live in a free state in a town with a college. And he lived in Peoria on and off between the mid-1940s and early 1950s. He participated, as I said, in his first nonviolent protest in Peoria. And he was working with a man named Barton Hunter and Benjamin Alexander. He met and married his wife in Peoria. He heard the call to ministry here. He was working at the old Foster and Gallagher's at the time. And it was Helen Gallagher who helped fund his move to seminary. Um, he preached his first sermon at Mount Zion Baptist Church. And it was here he encountered the first hints of the brutality he would experience in the South. He was with a black union leader named A.J. Martin. The night A.J. Martin bought activist and singer Paul Ropes into town. They drove through downtown Peoria so Ropes and could see the armed American Legion members who were out on the street searching for Ropes and to run him out of town or worse. C.T. Vivian took those lessons south and he worked there, he has said, not just to get voting rights, or not just to allow the integration of restaurants and interstate bus travel. Bus travel. We had to change the way the nation thought and felt and acted about his, its own humanities, he said, and the humanity of others. Very powerful. Thank you, Pam. Bill, you ready? Yes, sir. All right. Bill's going to talk about this uh, team and Richard. Thank you. Thank you all. And this has been very interesting because I've learned some things I never knew about some of these folks. For instance, I never knew I was ever going to have anything much to, to have in common with Betty for Gam, but I didn't know, she didn't know how to type either. I don't, I don't feel so dumb anymore. That's great. The uh, issue of Sheen. I want to talk about a couple other people, but it relates to Sheen, so sort of stick with me for a second. Uh, a few couple years ago, maybe three, four, five years ago, I wrote a column. It was about and this is the question I asked, if Peoria had its own Mount Rushmore, who would be on that Peoria Mount Rushmore? And I framed it as you would have to be to be on that Mount Rushmore at the pinnacle of your profession. You weren't just famous and from Peoria and you done good. You had to be really up there. Whatever you did, you were one of the big cheeses, okay? And you know, because you think about Mount Rushmore, there's four guys and I think they're Lincoln, <laughs> Jefferson, Washington, and, and Teddy Roosevelt. So there's 3.5 really, really at the top <laughs> possession guys up there, okay? I guess Roosevelt, whim of the time, whatever, but still, but still. So I, I cast it as they had to be at the top of their profession. And, and, and for an example, and I don't mean to be cracking on this guy at all, but um, uh, Dan Fogelberg, whom I, I revere as what he did and what he was and what he fought, uh, when he was sick, and I've written a lot about him since his death. He had great music. Um, his music, I think, is more appreciated now since he died. But I didn't think he. I don't think he would be on that Mount Rushmore. He's very talented. He sold a lot of records, but he never was. I don't think recognized as at the pinnacle of his profession. Okay. So I said, who could be on this? Who would be these? If there were four people, who would they be? And the the the, the two. I, I put two. I chose four. I was going to only do half the work. A, I'm lazy. B, I thought everyone else could do the other two. Okay? So I, I said, well, and this is a guy I'm going to talk about in a minute. It's Richard Pryor, who's been recognized as the greatest stand-up comedian of all time by multiple sources. We'll get to that in a minute. 
And the other was, and this is before he made the Hall of Fame, it was Jim Tomey, who isn't, I think he doesn't engender a lot of the excitement as some of these other more layered individuals we're talking about tonight. But you think about the national pastime. He's in the national pastime. The national pastime's most exciting event is a home run. He hit more home runs than maybe like six, seven, eight guys. So I'm thinking, uh, yeah, Peoria, Mount Rushmore, there's two. Okay, so why did I bring this up? Because the, about two or three weeks ago, I, I, this came to mind, and I'm like, yeah, those guys are on there. And then I thought about, what about Bishop Sheen? And to me, I'm like, hey, that guy should have been on this Mount Rushmore. As I thought about more, and I've written a lot about him in a lot of years. I'd never got to meet him. Of course, he died when I was 15, not even uh, living anyplace near here. But I think about what he did. I mean, you have this guy who's from this little town of El Paso, and he, he eventually comes to Peoria with his family. He's a, an altar boy at St. Mary's. He gets educated in, in, in the Catholic faith. He comes back to serve uh, at St. Patrick's for a little while, and then, then he's gone. He's, he becomes this kind of learned He's a studier of the Catholic faith, and he gets a radio show, and all of a sudden he parlays this into this new medium called television. And there he's up there, and he's, he's got his, his priest outfit on, and he's got a, a blackboard, and that's all he has except his sincerity for his faith. And, and all he's doing is answering probably the most important question of all is, why are we here, and what are we supposed to be doing here? And the guy was suddenly... A superstar. It, it was incredible that when I look at these statistics about the audience he had, it's just amazing. Because when, when you think about the dawn of television, think about Uncle Milty and those type of guys. Well, Bishop Sheen, at the height of his TV show, he was drawing not, almost 10,000 letters a week. 10,000 letters. I mean, people get out a piece of paper and write on this piece of paper and they send it. I can't imagine what that would translate to in today's emails and tweets and whatnots. It would just be, it's imperceptible. And you could say, well, there were only a few channels back then, but then again, not everyone had this amazing draw that Bishop Sheen had, that this people were riveted to this. And it, even he was doing better than, than Milton Berle at, at, at the time. And Milton Berle had one of his best lines. Because uh, someone said, hey, you're getting beaten by Bishop Sheen. And, and Milton Berle said, yeah, he's got better writers. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. <laughs> and just like many of the comics, comics at the time, he stole that line from Bishop Sheen, who, <laughs> who gave credit to those guys. He's kind of a funny guy, too. And, 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 and so these people are watching this, and it's, it's, it's just inc this amazing pull for this guy, again, who's just talking just extemporaneously. He's got a chalkboard, and that's about it. And he, 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 he would take on some serious business. He took on uh, Stalin. He warned that Stalin uh, had, would have his comeuppance. And I don't know if Stalin was watching this, but maybe you should, because a few days later, Stalin dropped dead. So I don't know if Bishop Sheen had a hotline for stuff like that, but pretty prescient, I would say. And he was a, he was a gutsy guy in other ways, too. He was, he, at that time, he was with the uh, New York, uh, the Archdiocese of New York, and he had some... It's New York. So, of course, there's giant egos. Not that Sheen had the ego, but Sheen had the, the, the guts to stand up for what he, what he thought was right. And although he was this big star, and I think that was part of the problem, the diocese got a little upset. He had, see, Sheen had raised a lot of dough. It was for a, a milk charity to give poor people milk. It was, that's it. It's not sexy. It's not anything. He gave his own money. He was working hard. And the diocese, the Archdiocese of New York, well, it wanted a little taste of the money. And, and Sheen was like, no, get, get lost. And so, okay, fine. And they, sh they shoveled him off to Rochester. See you later. So that's where he spent most of the rest of his, his life as a, as a bishop, an archbishop, that sort of thing. And um, so when I, I, I think about him, he just had this simple approach on television. And I wonder if you, today, you almost can't imagine, but... If they would give a chance, I don't know how you do this, it would be like uh, uh, Bishop Sheen uh, 2.0 on television. I know people would go crazy and they would, oh my gosh, it's some sort of spiritual thing, it's this religion, it's not that religion, you got to do all the religions. But I wonder, I mean, people watch this stuff and all it was was a guy answering questions about what we're doing, where we're going, and I'm thinking that would be an amazing, an amazing draw today. I mean, Roseanne's back. Yeah. <laughs> They can't see Sheen 2.0, and, uh, and there's obviously interest in the guy, and maybe you've seen some of this stuff about 
uh, the, the fight between the Peoria Diocese and the New York Archdiocese about his remains. Now, I'm not going to go into all of this rigmarole about Catholic canon and the proprieties of that and the sainthood requirements. For me, all I need to know to get involved in this and kind of kind of fight for the Peoria, uh, Peoria Diocese is because New York's on the other side. If, if there were an argument between North Korea and New York City about anything, I might be tempted to root for North Korea because <laughs> New York City. But, but, but it is, it's a matter of, hey, New York City, what's your, what's your beef here? You can't, I mean, you can't have them move these remains to Peoria. It would make a great deal of, make a great deal to this town, to the diocese here. And it, it would, it would uh, probably propel this sainthood to, the, to, to, it, to, its, to its end game. And he would become the first, the first American-born bishop. And that's, that's pretty amazing. It's amazing it'd be great for the diocese, but also for Peoria, too. And I don't know how that's going to uh, uh, break it, break it, or how it's going to end up. I think what's happening is the New York Di the New York Archdiocese is honestly, the linchpin of this is a claim of one of Sheen's nieces who's 88. So you know what they're trying to do in New York, delay, 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 and if she dies, it's, well, I don't know. I don't know if the fight goes on or not. But I do wonder about Sheen, if he's able to watch all this stuff and just look down and he's just like, hey, it is Sheen 2.0, in, in a different way. But this national fight that people are watching, it's, uh, it sure is interesting, however it ends up. Richard Pryor I did get to meet, and, and, I, and I'll talk about that in a moment. And it, it's going to sound a little odd here where I talk about maybe the, the funniest stand-up of all time in sort of a dour way, but um, having the opportunity to talk to him and having read so much about him, I think there's something worthy of pointing out about Richard Pryor that I think kind of gets glossed over. And what I mean is this. We have sort of this romantic notion about things of yore. For instance, uh, gangsters, gangsters of the 30s and 40s. We look at that as sort of, the, sort of this interesting shoot 'em up time, and we, we watch movies about this, and, and I get it. I get it. They're, it's interesting. It's kind of, it's, it's a really sort of, uh, it's a bygone era that we don't see now. This wide open Peoria stuff with the Sheltons and that sort of thing. And as part of that, there's also, we do look at maybe the Peoria of yore, this body Peoria where it was Saturday Night City, uh, that, 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 that there was this, this red light district where there was this wide open prostitution. We kind of look at it with a wink and a nod like, ah, yeah, back then, you know, what they do, what they chose to do and all that kind of stuff. And it was grim business all around, especially for Richard Pryor. Of, of all the people you talk about from Peoria, I can't think of anyone whose Peoria roots have had such a DNA-type impact on someone. And there was a, there recently there was a, a uh, Jerry Seinfeld special, and he's always been a Pryor fan. He called him the Picasso of our profession. That was... That was Seinfeld's words, and it was just a, it was a, it was about uh, Jerry Seinfeld growing up. It was just this, it was on Netflix, I think, and they're showing where he grew up in sort of this boring East Coast uh, subdivision. And he goes, "Well, here's where I grew up," and it's like any other tract house of the '70s. And he sighs and like you know Seinfeld. Just, <sighs> he goes, "Well, it's all I got. I didn't grow up in a whorehouse in Peoria," <laughs> <laughs> and and it is kind of funny in a Richard Pryor type way. But it, I think we think that, you know, there's that wink and a nod situation, but this is the part that, that just blows me away. Richard Pryor, you know, his, his, we know some of these facts. His grandmother ran this brothel. But it wasn't like he was in another part of town and he just sort of knew about this. He lived in this. And it was really, really, really nasty and grim. His grandmother raised him, beat the living heck out of him a lot, his mother was one of the prostitutes. It was a matter of Richard be outside, and there's someone would walk up and say, hey, boy, is your mom home? I need, and he, you know, fill in the sex act. And this is what he grew up in. And meantime, he's being abused sexually by people in his family and in the neighborhood. And that's a very, very sad story. It happens far too frequently in the big old world out there. But to me, it is amazing that he was able to at all 
get out of that and not become just a victim of drugs, a, a victim, become a, 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 a killer, a, 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 a drug dealer, or whatever, that he was able to, through Juliet Whitaker and, and the Carver Center, to, that his talents were sort of nurtured and to move on. And he did try to sort of take that at least professionally, sort of the straight and narrow. I mean, he was he was Cosby 2.0. If you see old clips of him, he's got the sweater. I mean, see Richard Swat, Richard Pryor in a, in a, in a sweater and a, and a shirt like this, it's like, whoa. And it's just kind of punchline gags. And I, I think you probably know this, this story that he was in, in Las Vegas one night and he, he gets out there for one of these runs and there's some famous people, Dean Martin, he stands up there and he goes, what the bleep am I doing here? drops the mic and walks out, and he becomes the Richard Pryor we know. And as I think about where he was from, that, that situation he was in, and his ability to share that, he wasn't, I mean, he, he is ranked by Rolling Stone, County Central, and other sources as the greatest comedian of all time, but it, it was more like he was just a storyteller, a, a reflector of what he grew up with. You could have taken uh, an army of sociologists, psychologists, historians, and other experts and dragged them through uh, with a time machine and looked at what happened to them. And they wouldn't have been able to do as good a job as Richard Pryor in reflecting what he and many, 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 many others went through at the time. And to do it in a candid way, that, that line between comedy and tragedy for Pryor is so thin. And you watch this and yes, he's got a lot of bad words, Yes, he's got a lot of crudities, but he is explaining where he came from. And for a lot of us, like guys like me who were listening to his albums when I was, you know, yay big, it was it was laughter, but it was also, wow, this is part of an America I don't see in my suburban tract house where I live, you know? And and, and today, today it still kind of shines through like that. And I watch it, and I'm like, I can't believe he's even able to stand up here and push through the pain and tell these stories. Now, he certainly did have his, his ghosts and haunts, and he was a very, very broken person. We're all broken people, but Richard Pryor, more than most, and he had a lot of, a lot of difficulties. But, but to keep pushing through to the end and, and trying to tell that truth that way, well, that's just something that, that, that's, that's just amazing to me. And toward the end of his career, which... In the, or maybe in the mid '90s when he stopped performing, I got to um, shoot out to to uh, Washington D.C. and he was doing a comeback tour on what would turn out to be his last tour, and he had started it in late 1992, and there were problems. He had already the MS had been uh, announced. He was having trouble just getting through his acts, and it was kind of like, wow, I wonder what it's going to be like here. And it was New Year's Eve, and this hall was filled, and he was sitting down, but he killed it stand up. He was just killing. You could tell he was tired. You could tell he was dragging, and he just killed. He was the Richard Pryor. That connection between the audience and where he'd been, it was just amazing. And I had arranged, I worked really hard at this to, to, to be able to have maybe 10 minutes with him afterwards. So I got downstairs, and, and Richard Pryor's kind of collapsed in a small sofa. And there might have been one person there just getting him water and whatnot. And someone said real gingerly, hey, and he looked, he looked like just like, like he just mowed like 97 lawns or whatever. He just was like slumped over and, and, and just not, not just looking like he was rested and recovering. And some, one of his handlers said, uh, Richard, there's someone here to see you. And he, he really was kind of like, oh, man, I don't, I don't know if I want to do this. And, and then she said, he's from the Journal Star in Peoria. And he, he all of a sudden perked up. And he was like, you ever see that Richard Pryor where his eyes get really big? But not, not in his scared way, but like, wow, like that little kid, he goes, the star? <laughs> and, and, he, and I thought it was like a setup for a joke. He was, he was impressed. He was kind of like, wow, this city that I've kind of cut off from my life, which, like Seinfeld, if you grow up in Oroz and Bureau, you kind of get it. I mean, it's a painful place. But he was kind of impressed that there was someone from his hometown come to see him. And long story short, we started talking for maybe a minute or two, and it was just kind of just this little back and forth. And then it was the hangers on. You know, it was the, the girls and the this guy and the, hey, Richie, blah, blah, blah. And they came in, and at that, he just snapped back into prior mode, and it was just one liner after one liner and one after another. And it was just kind of, I was like, dang, just when I was going to get a little bit of 
that Richard Pryor from Peoria, it had to become Richard Pryor, the onstage, you know, funny guy. So it's kind of, dang. But I got that little glimpse. But just before I left, I asked him, I said, okay, last thing, you know, what would you, what would you tell the Peoria folks back home? And there's a book called Furious Cool that came out a few years ago. And this starts the book, which is weird to have your name at the beginning of a book, mine, which is, it's about Richard Pryor. It's about this event because it's so, it's so Richard Pryor of what he said, and it, it has it quotes me, and I say, you hey, know, what what would you do? What would you tell the people back home? And he, he just gets all grim faced and goes, like Amityville Horror, get out. <laughs> <laughs> and it was funny, and I laughed, and I kind of looked back at him. He went, you know, he was doing his, you know, banter with these hangers on and whatnot, and I go, I know there's a part of him that feels that way, but I also know there's a part who really misses pure, or he misses. He misses what, he missed the part about Peoria that he wished could have been, if that makes any sense. You know, he, like he said, he said, you know, Peoria, where I, my Peoria was, happiness was, was a moment. It was a, it was a flash, it was, it was a snort, it was a glimpse. It wasn't anything that ever lasted. So I understand that divorcing of himself from the place, but there's that part of me that, you know, you, you think about it. That guy was Peoria. Whatever happened to him made him Richard Pryor. And what Richard Pryor was, and you're like, boy, you know, there is that part of you that, that you can't deny the effect Pure had on him. Kind of wish though what he experienced was uh, maybe there was a different Richard Pryor. It could have just been a, just a regular old guy who didn't have to go through all that stuff. But for what he did, for his courage and his ability to show a part of the world that few of us get to see, man, that guy's number one on Mount Rushmore. Thank you all. They're storytellers, aren't they? I ask you when you when you hear about the, the fake media and the media being bad people, these are the journalists that I know. These are the ones who uh, do the hard work and do it for you. I'd like to turn it over to you for what, what questions you have for the panel. Okay, sure. Go ahead, sir. So, we'll repeat your question in the mic. On Richard Pryor, what did what was the secret that Carver Center and what was her name? Whitty, Whitty, Julia Whitaker. Julia. What was the secret that broke the bond that he lived through to make well, he, he, was, he was? He like, was like. Uh, uh, the, the, the question, just so we could, could everybody could hear it, is what was the bond at the Carver Center that helped break through for? Yeah. Uh, they all He's on. Yes. Well, he. Uh, there were two things. One was that that, that in school he was uh, kind of a troublemaker, as you might guess, and the uh, uh, Juliet Whitaker though. I uh, saw that he was, he, he had this side of, he, he, he liked to tell stories. He liked to, he, a lot of it was mimicking. Like uh, one of the first things that was uh, eating soup and he could do it in a funny, funny, funny way. And so she encouraged him to do this and to come to the Carver Center and do plays. And he, he would host a lot of these talent shows that the Carver Center used to have. He was like the MC of all this, the funny guy. And he was uh, once in a play about uh, Rumpelstiltskin, and it just was it just kind of gave him that sort of that sort of place to go, and it was a fantasy away from the stuff that he had at home that he didn't want to face. He just liked doing that drama, comedy, anything that dulled that pain. He liked that other world of entertainment. Yeah. Can I just say it? Yeah. Um, I don't have a, a question. I have three statements. One was, in my women's study class in college, during World War II, they did have daycare for the children because the women had to work in the factories. Mm -hmm. So it is possible. It is possible to do that. Two, I wanted to say that I had the, the privilege of meeting Fulton Sheen twice. And the only, he came back to Peoria when St. Pat celebrated their 100th, and he came to the academy where I attended school um, for a fundraiser. And he was so gracious, he just gave us a blessing, not just, but he gave us a blessing, and I'll always remember that. 
And then Richard Pryor came back when his grandmother passed away. And he didn't come, he didn't want his, he didn't want to make a big thing of it. But he asked the kids from St. Pat's, St. Patrick's School, to come and sing at a, at a uh, the service for his grandmother. And he said, I don't even want to see the kids. I want, leave the curtain, pull, don't pull the curtain, but I want them to sing. Because his grandmother had enrolled him at St. Patrick's School, but he was not, he was expelled because of this relationship with the prostitution. But mm -hmm. at the end of that performance, the curtain was pulled because he said, you did a good job and I thank you. Oh, so he was a, he was a, good and kind man, and I'll never forget that as a seventh grader at St. Pat's, I think I was, how, how genuine his sincerity was in thanking us for being a part of that visitation and, and a tribute to his grandmother. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm a native Peorian. <laughs> understand that uh, Betty Friedan uh, was not so much a feminist as she was a, a humanist and wanting men and women working together. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? That, that probably is, is a, a fair assessment. Um, she, she was, I think, a humanist. I, but to get to be a humanist in those days, you know, you had to be a feminist as well. I think she was both. But as I said, you know, that the writing the name on uh, for the National Organization for Women on a napkin, and, and somebody had written of women, and she crossed it out and said for women. It's, we want men have to be a part of this. Men need to be a part of raising the family. This is not just a women's issue. And so, uh, yeah, and, and some of her views, of course, got her into crosshairs with what she called, you know, the radical Eastern chick who saw things differently, and it was one of the reasons that uh, she wasn't president of now for very long because they basically kicked her out. And um, she went, it, all that, and also because she was not the easiest person to work with, <laughs> as I learned when I was interviewing. <laughs> yeah. this Chris has said something to me. I don't know, maybe you've all heard the story of uh, my uh, going to interview Betty Friedan and what happened. Okay, okay. Um, I had heard that she was very difficult and that she had a reputation for throwing reporters out if they were insufficiently knowledgeable. So I went and read every doggone book she'd written. And at that point, there were four books. I mean, I had read, you know, Feminine and Mystique and, and Second Stage previously. I reread them. Anyhow, I was going to be prepared. I was not going to get thrown out. So we get there, and we bring along the... Uh, Channel 47 cameraman, and I, I even paid a kid to hold, this, this is back in the day, hold a tape recorder <laughs> so that uh, I, I, so we had quite a staff there. And um, so I asked her, I'm partly through the first question, or, or, or I asked her the first question, she starts to answer it, and her phone rings. And I look at her kind of and, you know, waiting to read in her eyes what she wants to do and seeing nothing. And she continues talking. So then she picks up, perks up her ears and she says, that's my phone. Get my phone. So the cameraman who's closest runs to get her phone. By then, of course, it's quit ringing. And so he comes back and tells her and apologizes. And she says to me, she says, I said, get my phone. If you can't, don't have the courtesy to get my phone, then I don't have the courtesy to sit for this interview. Now, we have, you know, plane tickets, hotel, uh, staff, and what in the world am I going to do? How am I going to, what do I do? So, of course, I apologize all over the place. I practically kiss her shoes. 
And then I say, but I was, what you were, your response to my question was so interesting. I did not want to interrupt you. And she sort of looks at me and she says, oh, and then she sits down and continues talking and we complete the interview and the interview that she had announced would only be one hour i managed to get her talking for two hours so, <laughs> so that, that is my and then i go back and i found these notes just a couple years ago my handwritten notes i, I said that i wrote when i was back in the hotel i say have three glasses of wine Take two aspirins, <laughs> go to bed, most difficult interview ever. <laughs> um, just a curiosity, because I'm so fascinated with people and history. Do you think that leaders are born or they fall into it because of circumstances, or just just curious, just these people we talked about tonight. What do you think? Well, they're all born. <laughs> I don't know if one is born to be a leader. I can't. I would say that most people have the ability to lead if they have the courage to to be leaders. It's a it, at some point it's you know what where what are you going to take a risk in what you believe in and what to do and how far are you going to push that? Because it's easy not to be a leader. But I mean we can't all be leaders. But so there if people are some people are just ingrained I think with 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 that sort of uh, uh, just tenacity. To, now, I, I think for a lot of for a lot for a lot of cases it's the it's the tenacity for the truth. Well, and there is some gray on truth, so it's not always black or white. Whatever a person believes, that tenacity to keep pushing it and pushing it and pushing it, that you don't stop, and that that makes you a leader. I think. If you look at C. T. Vivian and the fact that his mother and his grandmother. Two women alone in the uh, in the thirties moved from Missouri to Illinois to a town simply because it had a college. Says to me that in 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 a lot of ways, what goes into it is how you're prepared. They they specifically chose that. That always kind of fascinated me that these two women would, would do that. Um, and those stories are, are quite familiar, though, when you think about it. And so, and, every, and oftentimes, the things that happened to him, you saw that he was leaving Peoria to go to Nashville, which was at that time kind of the center of this very sophisticated study of nonviolence. So it threw him with um, some of the key people, Diane Nash, James Beth. Bevel, Kelly Miller Smith, and and they and they really started out there in Nashville, and they became known as so committed and so disciplined, and as I said, so disciplined in their outlook. That's how he ended up with King and SDLC, and they're the ones who, after. Um, uh, some freedom riders from the core, James Farmer, after they were um, forced to stop the freedom rides, it's the group from Nashville that stepped in. And, and so with Vivian, you see in a way that he was always at, the, at this place that he was getting the preparation to step in. So it's a combination, I guess, course, that's what I'm saying, I, yeah. I get you. Yeah. Great question, and I would echo what Pam said, it's a combination. You made me think, because there were distinct circumstances in both for Dan's and Brinker's life that propelled them to lead in the way they did. The death of a sister and the, the, anti, 
the anti-Semitism. But if that hadn't occurred, what, what would they have done? I, I think both would have been leaders in one way or another. And I'm reflecting back on what Betty Friedan did when I think it was in fourth grade, where she formed something at school called the Batty Batty Club. <laughs> she got sick of everybody at school being goody goodies. So she stepped up and formed the Batty Batty Club. Okay, that's, that's, that's a warm leadership of one kind. Yeah, I would agree that, that part, part of it comes from our, our background, our experiences, what, what's put upon us, but it, it's also those unexpected sparks that we each have the quality or capability to be a leader when we find that moment that, that inspires us to it or, or forces us to rise to that occasion unexpectedly. Thank you. Any other questions? My name is Joanna Walker. Uh, Reverend Vivian is my father. Uh, I just, uh, just kind of wanted to make a comment on some of the things that Pam said. Uh, plus, I wanted to comment on the fact that when she was talking about the third grade, that he said it was the first time that he experienced nonviolence because he was beating up this young man who had given him. Um, a Valentine's card that had a black face on it. And the little boy really didn't see anything wrong with that. You have to understand this is in Macomb. And so daddy was beating the boy up, but then the boy wouldn't hit him back. So daddy was like, that's not, it's not, this cannot be the way, you know? And that was in the third grade. So, but when I was thinking about people who have made an, a difference in America, I thought about the fact that daddy started the Upper Bound Program, which a lot of children would not have been able to go to college. College would have just become another dream faded away. And I'm kind of proud of Daddy for that. I did a 10-page research paper on him uh, when I was going to ISU. And um, I didn't know that. And I called him and I said something about him. He's like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's what I was really, you know, well, you don't know, but that's what he talks. Uh, he talks with his hands. If you, um, if you tie up his hands, you probably couldn't say anything. Okay, thank you very much. Yes? I'm sorry. I just have another comment. I know you said that, you know, the word that I'm, I didn't hear, I guess, was and the leadership is that you take advantage of the opportunity. You know, a lot of us have opportunities in front of us, but it's, it's recognizing that I could try to do this and then real, the realization that I can do this and how am I going to share that same opportunity with others. And I think that's a great thing about Peoria is that they provided a lot of opportunities, you know, especially in the past and I'm sure in the future. But one of the things like Children's Community Theater, which is an excellent place for people who are shy or who may not be as confident as others to use their talents and to grow those talents. So I think that there are opportunities in Peoria with the, with the free swimming and, and the, uh, all those things that happened in the 60s that you could go to Carver Center, you could go to uh, Longfellow School, you could go to Proctor Center, and you could be exposed to opportunities to do things that perhaps became a talent for you. So I think that's what makes uh, someone great, is taking advantage of that opportunity. Thank you. We'll take the last question. Yes? Uh, like everyone else here, I appreciate you sharing your stories. Uh, we love storytellers. There's a lot of interesting characters who came out of Peoria, and there's so much history that comes out of Peoria. And we like all the history books, and I'd like to encourage you and everyone else in the room to document the history of Peoria more. more. Uh, some of the local writers, like uh, Ken Zersky, uh has done some of that. Uh, Norm Kelly and Jerry Klein did a lot of that over the years. Um, so we'd like to see more written history. Uh, it, it, we love hearing it uh, verbally too, but 
uh, like to see it documented for the ages too. So thank you for sharing your stories. Thank you very much. I want to pop in on that real quick and, and make note of a, a couple, couple, two things since you mentioned Norm Kelly and, and his efforts with uh, two bits of recognition that, that PRA is going to have shortly if you've not heard about them, including the restoration of probably the first Civil War Memorial in the state of Illinois, going to be replaced up in Springdale Cemetery where it was originally intended to be by a vote of the PRA County Board of Supervisors in 1865 just months after the war ended, and ended up getting put down at the courthouse, then dismantled, then rediscovered. They're hoping that it will, will be put back up there by the end of this year. And uh, a memorial for George Ellis, one of the few combat casualties in the Spanish-American War, who was originally born in Peoria, spent his first couple of years here, and is going to be memorialized. Uh, you mentioned Norm Kelly, who's been leading some of the effort to do that, and we think we've got a bead on his granddaughter, and are working on and getting her to come back for uh, the dedication if it's possible for that. So two more Peoria stories that we'll be telling in the Journal Star and around the community in the coming months. Well, thank you. I want to thank everybody for supporting local, local journalism and supporting the Riverfront Museum. This has been a great, uh, we've been, we've, I don't know, I've had a lot of fun. Uh, <laughs> too, but, uh, I appreciate it. You have a great evening. Yes, before we wrap up, I just want to one more time, uh, on behalf of the Peoria Riverfront Museum, thank uh, the panelists and thank Dennis, Phil, Pam, Barb, Chris, Dennis. Uh, this, in my opinion, and I have seen hundreds of lectures and forums and service club presentations and panels and symposia uh, in my time in Peoria. This is the single finest forum on the his history of the leaders who've come out of Peoria I've ever seen. Number one, what do you think? <laughs>